Petra. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. Well, I am honored to be here, and I'm honored to talk about this topic, which I think is of, of grave importance. Uh, we've been talking a lot about the uh, horrific impacts of uh, plastic on the planet and on other species, uh, but plastic uh, hurts people too, especially poor people. Uh, and both in the production of plastic, the use of plastic, and the disposal of plastic, the people who, are, who have the, bullet, the, the, uh, the bullseye on their foreheads are poor people. Uh, we've, we, we, uh, people got very upset uh, when the BP oil spill happened. Uh, for very good reason. Uh, people thought about, oh my God, this is terrible, this oil, it's, it's, it's in the water, uh, it's gonna destroy uh, uh, the, uh, the, the living systems there, uh, people are gonna be hurt, uh, this is a terrible thing, that this oil is gonna hurt the people in the Gulf. Uh, what people don't think about is, what if the oil had made it safely to shore? What if the oil had actually got where it was trying to go? Uh, not only would it have been uh, burned in, in engines and added to global warming, but there's a place called Cancer Alley. And the reason it's called Cancer Alley is because the petrochemical industry takes that oil and turns it into plastic, and in the process, kills people. Uh, it shortens the lives of the people who live there in the Gulf. So oil and petrochemicals are not just a problem when there's a spill, there's a problem when there's not. And what we don't often appreciate is the price that poor people pay for us to have these disposable products. The other thing we often don't appreciate is it's not just at the point of production that poor people suffer. Uh, poor people also suffer uh, at the point of use. Uh, those of us who are in a certain income level, we have something called choice. Uh, the, re the reason you want to work hard and have a job and not be poor and broke is so you can have choices, economic choices. We actually get a chance to choose not to use uh, uh, products that have uh, uh, dangerous, poisonous plastic in them. Other people who are poor don't have those choices. So low-income people often are the ones who are buying the products that uh, have those dangerous chemicals in them, that their children are using. Uh, those are the people who wind up actually ingesting a disproportionate amount of this uh, poisonous plastic and using it. And people say, well, they should just you know, uh, uh, buy a different product. Well, the, part, the, the problem with being poor is you don't have those choices. You often have to buy the cheapest products. The cheapest pro products are often the most dangerous. And if that weren't bad enough, if it wasn't just the production of plastic, uh, that's giving people cancer in places like Cancer Alley and shortening lives, and uh, hurting poor kids at the point of use, at the point of disposal, once again, it's poor people who bear the burden. Often, you know, we think we're doing a good thing. You know, you're in your office, and you're drinking your, 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 your bottled water, or whatever it is, and you think to yourself, hey, I'm gonna throw this away. No, I'm gonna be virtuous. I'm gonna put it in the blue bin, you know? He's like, I put mine in the blue bin. And then you, you know. <laughs> Mm. And then you, you look at your, your colleague, you say, oh, you cretin, you know, you put yours in the white bin. You know, and, you know we feel so, so moral tickle, you know, we feel so good about ourselves. But if we, oh, well, maybe, okay, I'm speaking for myself. Not you, but I feel this way often. <laughs> and, you know, so we kind of have this kind of moral feel-good moment. Uh, but if we were to be able to follow that little bottle on its journey, we would be shocked to discover that all too often that bottle is going to be put on a boat uh, it's going to go all the way across the ocean uh, at some expense, and it's going to wind up in a developing country, often China. And it's, I, I think in our minds, we imagine somebody's going to take the little bottle and say, oh, little bottle, you know, we're so happy to see you, little bottle. You know, you've, you've served so well, you know. You give it a little bottle massage, you know, a little bottle medal, you know, and say, well, what would you like to do next, you know, and the little bottle says, I just don't know. But, but that's not actually what happens. Uh, you know, uh, that bottle uh, winds up getting burned. Uh, re re recycling of plastic in many developing countries is, means the incineration of the plastic, the burning of the plastic, which releases incredible toxic chemicals and once again kills people. And so uh, poor people who are making these products in petrochemical centers like uh, Cancer Alley, poor people who are consuming these products disproportionately, and then poor people who even at the, at the tail end of the recycling uh, are, are having their lives shortened are all uh, being harmed greatly by this uh, 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 addiction that we have to disposability. Now you think to yourself, well, I know how you are. You say, that sure is terrible for those poor people. You know? <laughs> it's like, it's just awful, those, those, those poor people. I, I hope someone does something to help them. Uh, 
But what we don't understand is, here we are in Los Angeles. We worked very hard to get the smog reduction happening here in Los Angeles. But guess what? Because they're doing so much dirty production in Asia now, because the environmental laws are, don't protect the people in Asia now, almost all of the clean air gains and the toxic air gains that we've achieved here in California have been wiped out by dirty air coming over from Asia. Okay? So we all are being hit. We all are being impacted. It's just the poor people hit, get it first and worst. But uh, the dirty production, the burning of, of toxins, the, 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 the lack of environmental standards in Asia is actually creating so much dirty uh, air pollution, it's coming across the ocean and has erased our gains here in California. We're back where we were in the 1970s. And so we're on one planet, uh, and we have to be able to get to the root of these problems. Well, the root of this problem, in my view, is the idea of disposability itself. You see, if you understand the link between the, what we're doing to poison and pollute the planet and what we're doing to, to poor people, you, you arrive at a very troubling but also very helpful insight. In order to trash the planet, you have to trash people. But if you create a world where you don't trash people, you can't trash the planet. So it's really uh, now we are at a moment where the coming together of social justice as an idea and the ecology as an idea uh, we, we finally can now see that they are really, in the end, end of the day, one idea. And it's the idea that we don't have disposable anything. We don't have disposable uh, uh, resources. We don't have disposable uh, species. And we don't have disposable people either. Uh, we, don't, we, we don't have a throwaway planet, and we don't have throwaway children. It's all precious. And as we all begin to come back to that basic understanding, new opportunities for action begin to emerge. Um, biomimicry which is uh, something that uh, is an emerging science, winds up being a very important social justice idea. For people who are just learning about this stuff, biomimicry means respecting the wisdom of all species. Uh, democracy, by the way, means respecting the wisdom of all people, and we'll get to that. But biomimicry means respecting the wisdom of all species. It turns out, you know, we're pretty clever species. You know, we have this big, you know, cortex or whatever. We're pretty proud of ourselves. But if we want to make something hard, you know, we come up, I know, you know, I'm gonna make a, a hard substance, I know. I'm gonna get, you know, vacuums and furnaces and drag stuff out of the ground and, you know, get things hot and, and you know, poison and pollute. But I got this hard thing, you know. <laughs> I'm so clever. You know, you look behind you and there's destruction all around you. But guess what? You're so clever, but you're not as clever as a clam, right? A clam shell's hard. There's no vacuums, there's no big furnaces. There's no poison, there's no pollution. It turns out uh, that our other species has figured out a long time ago how to create many of the things that we need using biological processes that nature knows how to use well. Well, that insight of biomimicry, of our scientists finally realizing that we have as much to learn from other species, I don't mean you know, taking a mouse and you know, sticking with stuff, I don't mean learning from that way, <laughs> you know, abusing the little species. I mean actually respecting them, respecting what they've achieved. Uh, that's called biomimicry, and that opens the door to zero waste production, zero pollution production, that we could actually uh, enjoy a high quality of life, a high standard of living, without trashing the planet. Well, that idea of biomimicry, respecting the wisdom of all, pe of all species, combined with the idea of democracy and social justice, respecting the wisdom and the worth of all people, would give us a different society. We would have a different economy. We would have a green society uh, that Dr. King uh, would be proud of. That should be the goal. And the way that we get there is to first of all recognize that the idea of disposability uh, not only hurts uh, the species we've talked about, but it even uh, corrupts our own society. We're so proud to live here uh, in California. You know, we just had this vote and everybody's like, well, not in our state. You know, we, those, I don't know what those other states were doing, but. You know, just so proud. <laughs> and yeah, I'm, I'm proud too. But uh, California, though we lead the world in some of the green stuff, we also unfortunately lead the world in some of the gulag stuff. Huh? California has uh, one of the highest incarceration rates uh, of all the 50 states. So we're, we're, we have a moral challenge in this movement. Uh, we're passionate about uh, uh, rescuing some dead materials uh, from the landfill, but sometimes not as passionate about rescuing living beings, living people. And I would say 
that uh, we live in a country, 5% of the world's population, 25% of the greenhouse gases, but also 25% of the world's prisoners. Right? One out of every four people locked up anywhere in the world is locked up right here in the United States. So that is consistent with this idea that uh, disposability is something we believe in. And yet, uh, as, a mo as a movement that has to broaden its constituency, that has to grow, that has to reach out beyond our, our natural comfort zone, one of the challenges to the success of this movement, of getting rid of things like plastic and, and helping the economy shift, is people look at our movement with some suspicion. And we, they ask a question, and the question is, how can these people be so passionate? I, a poor person, a low-income person, somebody in Cancer Alley, uh, somebody you know, in, in, in Watts, uh, somebody in Harlem, somebody on an Indian reservation, might say to themselves, and rightfully so, how can these people be so passionate hmm, about making sure that a plastic bottle has a second chance in, in life, or an aluminum can has a second chance. And yet, when my child gets in trouble and goes to prison, he doesn't get a second chance. How, how can this movement be so passionate about saying we don't have throwaway stuff, no throwaway dead materials, and yet accept throwaway lives and throwaway communities like Cancer Alley? And so we now get a chance to be truly proud of this movement. Uh, when we take on topics like this, it gives us that extra call uh, to reach out to other movements and to become more inclusive and to grow. And we can finally get out of this crazy dilemma that we've been in. Uh, most of you are good, soft-hearted people. Uh, when you're younger, uh, you cared about the whole world, and at some point somebody said you had to pick, a, pick a, a, an issue, right? You had, to, you had to boil your love down to an issue. Can't love the whole world, you've got to work on... Uh, you got you to work on trees, or you got to work on immigration. You got to you know, shrink it down and be about one issue. And really, they fundamentally told you, uh, are you going to hug a tree, or are you going to hug a child? Pick. Are you going to hug a tree, or are you going to hug a child? Pick. Well, when you start working on issues like plastic, you realize that the whole thing is connected. And luckily, most of us are blessed to have two arms. We can hug both. Thank you very much. Woo!